All right, so this is the podcast called No Dumb Questions, where I, Destin, uh, I have a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day, but I like to learn about science and technology and learn things of that nature, but I also like to tiptoe into other areas. And uh, Matt, you're the history guy. What uh, what kind of stuff do you like to study? I like history, philosophy, theology. But the thing that I really, really like trying to wrap my brain around is how we went from thinking whatever it was we used to think to thinking whatever it is we think now. I like the history of ideas. Awesome. So we do this thing on No Dumb Questions every once in a while where, I don't know how to say this, it's usually we're having a conversation and we're going back and forth and we're both adding things to the pile that we're learning about. This is a very different style that we're going to do today. This is one of these moments where you've learned the thing and you've done the research and I've stayed over here and I'm pretty dumb on the, on the topic. I'm going to be the absorber of information and you're going to be the giver of information. Is that a good way to describe this? Well, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, but you're a smart guy and you think about things and you pay attention to what's going on around you. So yeah, feel free to slow me down at any point and let's game the thing out a little bit more than just a data dump from me, if you know what I mean. Okay, cool. So in the spirit of the name of the podcast, Notum Questions, I'm going to ask you questions and I guess you're going to teach me and I'm just going to sit here and learn stuff about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let's do it. But if I think any of those questions are born out of ignorance or offend me, I'm going to berate you. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Okay, buddy, I know you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls because everybody's at least heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but what do you know about them? I know that the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were found in clay pots somewhere in the desert, I'm guessing near the Dead Sea. Very good. And my understanding is that it wasn't like an archaeology team that found them. It was like a, a shepherd or something like that, like a, like a young person found these scrolls. And when we pulled the, the scrolls out and like put them in like a big room, in my mind, it's like a bunch of old school Indiana Jones style archaeologists. They all started looking at these things and reading them in some kind of ancient language. It ended up being really important for the Bible. My understanding is there's something about these scrolls, these Dead Sea Scrolls, that lends credibility to the Bible. And so Christians and Jews are very interested in these things, and other people are like, oh, well, that's an interesting archaeological thing. But what I don't know is when they were written, who did them, why? I just don't know what it is. Is it like an early copy of the Bible? I just don't know. That's where I'm at. That's really good. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient documents that date all the way back to about 250 years before the time of Jesus. So what is that? 2002? Before the time of Jesus? Before. So like B.C.? Yeah, this is before there's a Roman Empire. Okay, so, so, when so right, right off the bat, things, you just told me that the New Testament, which is after yeah. Jesus, the New Testament is not part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is that the first thing I just learned now? That is correct. Okay. Yep, there are a couple of things about the Dead Sea Scrolls that maybe shed a little bit of light or insight on the New Testament, but the people who wrote it, they wouldn't have been into the Christian New Testament things. They were into the Jewish Old Testament things. So there would have been no reason for them to keep New Testament documents as we know them hanging around. And let me just throw out a disclaimer here, buddy. I know that anytime we have a conversation like this and we invite the third chair to hang out with us, there is a huge variety of people who do so. And I know, third chair, that there are some of you who are like, oh, awesome, something having to do with the Bible. I think the Bible's a really important book, and I believe some of what's in there, or maybe all of what's in there, and that's really exciting for me. And I know there are others who are like, I don't really care for that book very much, and I don't care for the religions that it is produced, and I don't think there's anything to it. I totally get and respect where people are coming from on that. What I think is fascinating about this is that it really isn't, first and foremost, a topic or debate about whether the Bible is true or somebody believes in God or not. It's just fascinating archaeology about a thing that has huge cultural implications and historical implications. And so I think this will be a fun one to unpack regardless of where people are coming from. Is that fair enough? Yeah, totally. But, I mean, I've already learned things. First of all, you mentioned that they were discovered in the 1940s. I didn't know that. Yes, when I think 1940s, I think World War II. So does that mean that these things were found in the middle of World War II? Or like what year are we talking here? No, they were found just after World War II. Okay. So World War II wraps up in the mid-1940s. This is getting into the later 1940s. Okay. So what we're talking about is a really rugged, badland kind of area near the Dead Sea, 
about 20 miles away from Jerusalem to the east and way, way downhill. So Jerusalem is above sea level. The Dead Sea, is it the lowest place on earth? Do you know? I don't, but you've actually been there, right? I have, and it's crazy. <laughs> like I've never seen anything like this place. Have you, have you seen the videos and stuff on the internet of people swimming in the Dead Sea and like they float weird and everything? Yeah, it's my understanding because it's so salty, you're like super buoyant. And so it's you can't dive down, or at least it's very difficult to without weights. Have you done it? Yeah. It, oh, it's off the charts. You can't drown. Even when I would try to go on my belly when I was swimming in the Dead Sea and just put my face down to see if I could drown, I was like, I don't think I can die in this. There's got to be a way. <laughs> but like, It's like you know putting the same pole on a magnet up against another same pole on a magnet. It just will not work. I really? can't be fat enough to sink in this. Yeah, it was bizarre. But is it like and super duper salty to the, t I mean, does it burn your eyes like crazy? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, you can smell it. It's not like being at the ocean where you kind of just have a little bit of that saline feel in the air. It is pungent. It's everywhere. It smells like wet salt. Where we were at was a particularly muddy area. Some of the Dead Sea is more blue and beautiful as well. But we got down in the water with a boatload of other tourists, and my kids get in the water, and you know how you normally have the dad restrictions on how far the kids can be from you when you're swimming and all of that? Absolutely, yeah. I immediately revoked it all. I was like, never mind, kids. It's impossible to drown. Just go uh, swim to Jordan. I don't care. See, see what happens. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just crazy. And it's really fun, too, because there's this like... Uh, this mud concoction at the bottom at the north end of the Dead Sea that you can grab fistfuls of and people are like rubbing it around on their nipples and stuff and like, oh, this is good for the nipples and it gets rid of back knee and I don't know what people thought they were accomplishing, but everybody's okay, okay. giving themselves right, here, th th mud throttle baths. Back, throttle back a little bit. So I, I can't tell what's satire here and I can't tell what's real. Nothing like is there, satire. Oh, this is no, real. nothing is satire. Yeah, this is all real. Yeah. So people literally yeah. think, okay, okay. Yeah, they think there's some kind of healing quality to... That mud. I mean, there's all kinds of makeup products and stuff that are rooted in the, the elements of the Dead Sea and the mud from the Dead Sea, like Dead Sea mud baths are a thing that they sell all over the world. This is a real thing. Okay. All right. And I'm not kidding. Like the old dudes were just taking handfuls and like massaging it on their chests in ways that were really creepy and Eastern European. I didn't really know what to do with it. Okay. All the more reason to just send the kids far, far out to sea. So the Dead Sea is weird, man. Have you ever been to any badlands or like really rugged Mars-like terrain anywhere? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've been way off in the desert to places you normally can't go. Mm -hmm. There was this one missile range I worked on one time where you have to get briefed on turtles before you go out into, like you're going to go hundreds of miles out there, or maybe not hundreds, dozens and dozens of miles out in the middle of nowhere. And if you see a turtle you have to stop all operations because if the turtle sees you and gets scared and pees like in defense, like it's, oh God, and it just pees and runs away, that's like all the water that turtle has for the entire what? X number of months. They literally have a government-appointed turtle hydration specialist that you will radio in. You're like, oh, Dingo Whiskey, we got a turtle that's just dehydrated itself at quadrant XYZ, and he's like, we're on the way, and they'll like come out there and they'll hydrate the turtle because water is so precious in those environments. Okay, 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 okay. You got to throttle back here. I can't tell what is satire and what is not. <laughs> it's all real. Yeah, that's all real. Okay, anyway, the point is, yes, <laughs> I've been to places that okay. are very, very dry. Okay, and why would someone go out and live there next to the turtles that shouldn't pee? They wouldn't. There's no reason to live there. You, this is a point of transit. Like, you go through this place to get somewhere else. And to, like, learn things about yourself, metaphorically. Okay. Yeah. You don't go to the desert for any reason other than, like, some sort of emotional, personal, existential, spiritual journey. It's just the only reason you'd end up there is if you had some very unique opportunity to make a buck or if there were social pressures from elsewhere that pushed you into a place nowhere else would want to be, but, right? But what's interesting, yes, absolutely. But there's other things. I can feel you pulling me in the right direction here. So, for example, out in Arizona, or maybe, I don't know where it is, maybe it's Nevada, I don't know, there are aircraft graveyards out there because the the environment, the climate locally is so dry and arid that things get preserved for a really long amount of time. And so are you kind of walking me in that direction? Or are you about to tell me that the Dead Sea Scrolls are where they are because— it was so dry in that area that they would be preserved for a long amount of time. Is that where you're taking me? Yeah. There are three factors, and that's good anticipation. 
Factor number one for why we were able to recover scrolls that got put in caves over 2,000 years ago that are still intact enough to read today. Reason number one that they're still there is because the people who put them there didn't live in a more populous place where they would have been discovered. They lived somewhere that was crazy remote, so people just weren't rifling through the caves for 2,000 years looking for anything of value. If they had done the same thing in like downtown Jerusalem, like how many times has that been built up and built over and conquered and people going through it with a fine tooth comb because they want religious artifacts? Well, not the case when you're talking about really inaccessible caves halfway up the side of a cliff face that nobody except a random shepherd once every couple thousand years would ever bother to go into. So yeah, that is one factor, the remoteness. But another factor, and you would understand this way better than me, is that obviously certain types of soil contain certain microorganisms that work more quickly on organic material than other types of soil. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yeah, I, I would assume so. It, it sounds right. Just intuitively, if we took a wadded up piece of tissue paper and we threw it out in like a really black, thick, potting soil kind of composty mixture out in the backyard we would expect that to dissolve and go away much more quickly than if we set the same thing in an alkaline or very arid cave where there are no elements that it's being exposed to and it's getting shelter, right? Like one's going to get eaten quicker than the other. The more organics that are present, the more moisture so that these you know organic processes can do their thing. Yeah, totally. Makes sense. Okay. So there's two factors then as to why these things were still sitting around and were still legible 2,000 years after the fact. One, they were in a remote place. Two, they were in a very dry place. And then three, it has to be something having to do with the climate itself because it's not humid, because maybe you've got this salinity in the air. I don't know. It just created this perfect environment for preservation. Have you ever seen any of the peat bog people, like the humans that got stuck in some peat bog somewhere in Europe, and then we find them a thousand years later and they still look like a person? Yeah, I have. In In Germany, there's this, uh, this whole peat bog area, and there's this whole archaeology thing associated with it. It's fascinating, which seems like the opposite of the Dead Sea, right? Real dry and arid. This is like real moist. And so you would think that if you fell into a bog, you would rot immediately, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I don't understand the chemistry, but something's going on there. Yeah, I saw, this is ironic, because I, I saw a display about the bog people at the Denver Natural History Museum, and I also saw the Dead Sea Scrolls for the first time at the Denver Natural History Museum. And so it really is opposite ends of the spectrum where two very different environments preserved something really, really well. So whatever the case, normally if you write something down on a sheet of paper in the era of Alexander the Great or just after Alexander the Great, you would expect that to be gone by now. You're just not going to be able to go and pull that up. But in this particular situation, not only were we able to find one or two things that were written down, we were able to find like a thousand fragments or partially complete, or even almost fully complete scrolls documenting a whole bunch of different stuff, including a bunch of what we call the Old Testament. What would be the holy grail in your discipline? Fusion propulsion? Perpetual energy machine? Like, what would be the thing that if you found it, it would change everything? Oh, dude. Uh, psh, yeah, it'd be fusion. Like, figuring fusion out is a big deal. Fusion, where you have a gain of more than one, so that you know, you could sustain fusion to the point where you could extract energy from it and powerhouses. That would be the holy grail at this point. Do you know why I understood what you just said? <laughs> because our, our previous episode where you learned about fusion propulsion? Yeah, because Dr. Casper taught me things, and now I understand how that all works. Not all of it, but I understood well enough to at least get what you were saying. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank him. Yep. So are you about to tell me that the Dead Sea Scrolls are the holy grail for your... For your discipline? Well, I, no, it's more well, than the Holy Grail. In a lot grail. of ways, the Holy Grail is the Holy Grail of this <laughs> discipline. I mean, if you could find that, that would be uh, that'd be well, the winner, right? I've never understood why the Holy Grail was so important, to be honest with you. It's important because of medieval legends. It's mythology is where it's at. Like the Holy Grail, I don't know, to be honest with you, I mean, the Monty Python in Search for the Holy Grail is my favorite. <laughs> it's one of the best vi movies yeah. ever. But uh, you know what? I need to expose my children to that. Anyway, that's a that's a rabbit trail. So and I'm going to follow it for about rabbit trail. Monty Python, I see what you did there. I'm going to follow it for like 10 more seconds because it really is an interesting question that you just asked and that we're putting a pin in it. We're coming right back to Dead Sea Scrolls. 
the Holy Grail thing is something that was really interesting because, you know, Joseph of Arimathea, or supposedly it was maybe the cup that caught, like, the blood of Jesus. And so, can, we just, can we just stop and you just do a whole episode on that in a future future episode? Because I really want to know all that stuff, and I don't want to just do lip service to it. Like, I want to learn this okay. stuff. Yeah, yeah as long episode? as we're doing some kind of, like, verbal handshake agreement that we're going to do a Holy Grail episode someday, yes, roger yeah, that. I'm putting my hand behind your thigh right now, virtually. Yes. Oh, oh, whoa. Co- that's covenant. A little deeper in there than you need to be, pal, even over the internet. Okay, Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to have to get into the whole Holy Grail thing deeper in a minute because this really is the Holy Grail or one of the Holy Grails of studying ancient texts and manuscripts, but we haven't done enough to explain why and have you be dazzled by it, and I don't want you to be not dazzled. So we're going to come back to why it matters in just a minute. Pin is in that. Dazzle me, Matt. Dazzle me. So you find all these texts. And the big question that people are going to be asking is, first of all, you know, where did they come from? And second of all, what do they say, right? The question of what's in them gets answered by the fact that this discovery happens near this ancient settlement called Kerbet Qumran. Qumran is what it typically gets called. It's not a big community. Can you spell that, please? The first one starts with a K and it has like an H and a T in it somewhere. And then Qumran is Q-U-M-R-A-N, Qumran. Is that an Arabic term? You know what? Yeah, it must be. Yeah, it must be, because this is technically in... Palestine, right? ...what most people, without making any political statement whatsoever, would define as part of Palestine right now. Okay. This area is in a historically disputed territory over the last half century, 70-ish years, and generally speaking, there hasn't been a whole lot of hostility over this particular archaeological site because everybody appreciates the gravity of the thing. It was found by Bedouin shepherds, so those would be, I assume, Muslims, and it's held in a Palestinian area that is largely associated with Islam, but Palestine has a ton of Christians in it as well, and it's right next to, well, it is historical Israel, so obviously there's a lot of interest in it from that perspective as well. How did I do it threading the needle there? I'm trying to thread a needle. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm less interested in anything that trying to couch what you're saying to make sure people are happy. I'm more interested in the topic itself. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that the reason the Dead Sea Scrolls were even discovered in the first place is because they were put in a specific location on the Dead Sea that was A, mm-hmm. in a very low population density. Yes, sir. B, the soil was specifically set up so that microorganisms wouldn't jump on and bacteria destroy the scrolls themselves. And C, the climate itself was arid, and there wasn't a certain amount of moisture that, you know, would kill stuff. Is that my understanding of why they were discovered at all, after thousands of years? Yeah. Okay. Yes, that would be my read on it. That's a very succinct way to put it. So big, big picture here. 2,300-ish years ago, there's a group of people who are a part of Judaism, and they don't like the way Judaism is going. There's a liberal component to Judaism, there's a more conservative component, and this division within Judaism becomes more pronounced after Alexander the Great comes through Israel and bloodlessly, according to Alexander at least, liberates Jerusalem. From who? Jerusalem does not resist what? They uh, from themselves. Oh, okay. Got that kind of liberation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. it's a tough one because... I don't want to go to the beginning of time to explain this, but the quick version is in the 6th century BC, the Babylonians conquered the Jewish people, the Israelites, the southern kingdom of Judah, and they took them into captivity in Babylon. And then a generation later, the Persians came along and defeated the Babylonians under the leadership of Cyrus the Great. Then Cyrus the Great was like, you know what, we're going to do things different than Babylon. Instead of relocating everybody, we're going to let people go home and do a little bit of self-governance. The Persians were pretty enlightened, pretty progressive. They get portrayed negatively in 300, but really pretty good empire as ancient empires go. So the Jews go back and are able to govern themselves using their law as something of a constitution and a civil law which creates some challenges because it wasn't really built for that. And they do this for the course of a couple hundred years, but then, of course, the Greeks and the Persians, again, this is your Sparta and Leonidas and all of this, in the background of the Hebrew, the Jewish, the Israelite people trying to rebuild their people under the distant authority of Persia, Persia and the Greeks are fighting and fighting and fighting, and eventually 
Alexander the Great comes along and he's like, enough with this Persia thing. We're just doing a big march of conquest. And he gets in a big fight with Darius III, emperor of Persia, battles his way all around this giant march of conquest and establishes himself as effectively king of everything. It's the, the largest empire the world had ever seen at that point. And along the way, the Jewish people were like, yeah, this is a runaway train. We're just going to roll with this. And so Alexander takes possession of Jerusalem, and it is absorbed into this larger Alexandrian empire. Well, then Alexander dies a few years after that. His generals divide up the empire, and the Seleucid empire is born out of one of those generals, and it rules over modern-day Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, that part of the world. This goes okay for a while, but the thing about Alexander, he was smart. He knew that the key to making this work was not to crush people, it was to integrate with people. So he spreads the Greek language and Greek culture and Greek writing and Greek wives all over his new empire. And Greek overnight becomes the lingua franca of the whole world. This is called uh, Hellenism the Hellenistic era. It's the Greek-ish era when Greek culture integrated with everything, including Jerusalem. You know how the Jewish people felt about other religions mingling with their religion, right? Yeah, it was no bueno. They didn't like it. Increasingly, the relationship between the very traditional Jewish people and their Greek overlords becomes more and more contentious until eventually one dude, a Greek king named Antiochus Epiphanes, go so far as to profane the temple and sacrifice a pig, or he threatens to do so. Counts differ as to whether it actually happened in the temple of God. It's unfathomable. I, I don't even know what horrible taboo I could liken it to today. It was unfathomably evil and revolting and awful in the eyes of the Jewish people at that time. So they're like, yeah, we're done here. And they have a great big revolt, and the revolt is led by the Maccabees family, this is what Hanukkah is a celebration of, and they establish a new kingdom called the Hasmonean dynasty, and that is ultimately conquered by Julius Caesar's buddy Pompey in the middle of the first century BC, about 60 years before Jesus. In the middle of all of that time, there are Jewish people who are like, look, I think we just need to play nice with our Greek overlords and adopt their culture and language. We can synthesize our belief in God with Greek beliefs. And there are other Jews at the time who are like, heck no, we cannot. There's nothing in common between the two. We need to get rid of these people. And then there are others yet who say, we're retreating from the whole debate. We're going to go make a compound. We're going to focus on spiritual things and personal good behavior and right, pure living. And we are going to live in harsh conditions, but we divorce ourselves from all of this. These people are called the Essenes. And we believe those are the people who founded Qumran. So all of that history is meant to explain how these people went out into the desert in the first place, all of the social and political pressures that they faced that caused them to go out there, and then ultimately how this one big final straw event was the thing that caused them to say, hey, we got to get out of here, caused them to stash these scrolls in these caves and disappear to wherever they went. That was a lot of information. Did that make sense? Yes, and well done, by the way. Applause for reviewing Thanks, that. Thanks, buddy. It was like, how much, 600 years of antiquity you covered right there? We covered a lot. So you're saying that these scrolls were put in this cave by the Essenes just before Christ? When did this happen? Okay, yeah. So that's the next question. The first question is, who were these people and where did they come from? We've covered that. They live in this unique community that's almost like a monastic community where monks live with all these rules and different times of day. They have to do different chores. We know they had incredibly short lifespans, and we know they really liked the written word and were really into prophecy and what Christians call the Old Testament, what Jews call the scriptures. One second, one second. How, how did we know they had short lifespans? Meaning them as a people, like collectively, they had a short run of their little microculture, or like each individual human had a short lifespan themselves? They died young, yeah, in part without access to even what we would now call very primitive medical care, but without access to society. It was just a harsher life in harsher conditions. We also know, this is really interesting, the excavations at Qumran have revealed that the way they set up their latrine area, their toilets a few hundred feet from the settlement, 
we went back and we were able to – not we. I had nothing to do with this. People way, way, way smarter than me who are good at these things in the place where science and history meet – Went and did some digging around and discovered that there were massive, very harmful to human bacterial colonies that were being tracked back in from the latrines to the places where food prep happened and where people lived. And it's estimated from – I couldn't tell you the whole process, but it's estimated that the average lifespan in Qumran was something in the mid-40s, which was much lower – than what people were experiencing, say, in Jerusalem or any of the other major Roman hubs. How, how can you know that? Like, how how can archaeologists know that? I'm skeptical that you can find that information from things in the dirt, unless one guy wrote it down like, man, really stinks that we only live about 40 years old. That's unfortunate. Meanwhile, got to go die later. You know, unless there was something like that written down, how can you know that? I think there may be written records on this. And I'm, I'm shooting from the hip entirely because this isn't – I don't specialize in this stuff at all. If I recall correctly, there's stuff written down that give clues suggesting it was a shorter lifespan here. Additionally, they buried people. And when you go and look at burials, you can kind of figure out how old somebody was based on features of bones and jaw and teeth and all of that stuff. And it looks like there aren't really a lot of old people that were getting buried. And I think that's part of how they reasoned to this estimated lifespan. Okay. And then corroborating that with the latrine data that they got, that seemed to support it and offer an explanation. Again, could be way off. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to be honest with you, like I feel like the latrine data, I feel like that is a a solution looking for a problem is kind of what that feels like to me. That sounds like somebody's PhD research for like, oh, well, we know this thing is true, so let's make up something that makes it sound true. That's just what it sounds like to me. I remember, and this is why I say that because it's not I'm not throwing stones at your discipline. I specifically remember one test a long time ago on the rocket range. We fired a thing, and I called on the radio, and I was like, hey, uh, person that's running the radar, what range did that thing land at? And I will never forget the response. It was, what range was it supposed to land at? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, so, so you're talking about, like, housing appraisals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what is, How what much is, is this house supposed worth? to be? What's the contract for? It's worth that much then. Yeah, I'll exactly. take $500 now, please. Exactly. Yeah. And no so, offense and so, to all the appraisers out there. And so the latrine data thing, just, I, I don't know, I, I'm not throwing stones at, I, I just, I think it's no, a no, no, really, no. really weird thing. Yeah, and I have done a terrible job of presenting that. That's just not my primary area of interest or knowledge on this at all. So I would guess that the data on that is much, much more convincing than what I've presented, but... I would also readily concede that in all disciplines, there are PhD dissertations that get written to answer a legitimate question and others that get written because you have to write one. Absolutely. And, I don't know. Poop. That sounds interesting. Let's write about that. And I don't know which this is. So um, I no doubt have done a poor job of representing it. Whatever the case. No, no. You've, you've taught me many things. You taught me about why we were able to find them, mm -hmm. you know, the population density, the types of soil, and the climate itself. You've taught me where they were found, which is in Qumran. And you taught me the, the name of the people that put them there, which are the Essene people, mm -hmm. and even what those people were all about. Like, they had this little compound, and the purpose of the compound was to try to, like, go out and, like, do your own little thing. Am I tracking what you're saying? Yeah, very rigorous conservative religious discipline. That's the kind of stuff they were into. Okay. And they thought the world was going to end. They had an apocalyptic view of the reasonably near future, and they spent a lot of time writing and thinking about what their role would be when all of this prophecy came to fruition and stuff got crazy and went down even possibly militarily. So it's not hard to liken them to... So a, they were preppers. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. And I apologize for not being more clear on some of the excavation questions, the, like the latrine thing, which I think is super interesting, but I just, I just don't know that that well. Now so covering a bunch. you were asking the question, though, about when they actually hid the scrolls. And what's interesting about that is that initially they had no reason to hide the scrolls. Nobody was going out there to bother them 250 years before Jesus during the early part of the Seleucid, that's the Greek overlord empire that was going on there. But these people just sat out in the desert and watched that come and go. And then they sat out in the desert and watched this massive Jewish rebellion that put an end to the Seleucid Empire, the Greek occupation. 
And then they watched the Hasmonean, the Jewish dynasty, come and go. They watched Pompeii come and enter the Holy of Holies and the temple in Jerusalem. They watched or got the news maybe that Julius Caesar got assassinated. They maybe heard rumors about different messianic claimants coming and going like Jesus of Nazareth. They lived in the same zip code as John the Baptist. They no doubt knew who John the Baptist was. A lot of people think John the Baptist might have hung out there and even swapped influence with this particular community of Qumran. They have a lot in common. But then what happened is there's a really pivotal incident under the Roman authority that starts to change the political climate for the people in Qumran and starts to make them feel like they can't hide out here much longer. So the Romans did a thing that we call the the client-king model. Let me ask you this. Who was in charge of things in Judea during the time of Jesus? You mean specifically, so you're going to say Pontius Pilate? Sure. That's one, but then where does Herod fit? Uh, Above it. So Herod is like the governor, and Pontius Pilate was like the mayor, is how I think of it. Is that right? That's a good guess. It's not quite right. The way it actually worked is they were corresponding authorities— So the governor was appointed by Rome, and this was usually someone who was decidedly Italian in descent. Pontius Pilate was, as you remember us talking about, from just right down the road from Rome. He was there to represent the interests of Rome, to maneuver things around militarily, keep order, and collect taxes. He is the supreme authority when it comes to Rome's representation there. So he is the governor. Herod, and eventually Herod's descendants— have different roles in what is often called an ethnarchy. They are an ethnic local ruler whose job it is to cooperate with the governor, the actual Roman governor, to keep order, collect taxes, but also to be a little bit more aware of and sensitive to the cultural needs of the local area. It'd be like the governor of Illinois interacting with the mayor of Chicago. So I got it backwards. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe just a little bit. So Herod was below Pontius Pilate. Herod might not have agreed with you, but I think history bears out that Roman governors had the trump card over client kings. Okay. So yes, I would say Pilate was above Herod. Okay. So what happens then is that at times this system works, and at times it doesn't work very well, and there's this big faction within the Jewish people, even during the time of Jesus, you remember this, who were like, well, we want Jesus to be a a military messiah who will kill the Romans and give us another Jewish dynasty. We want the occupiers gone. And there were still other people who were like, no, I'm only concerned with spiritual matters, and still others who were trying to be sophisticated and buddy up to the Roman occupation. That was the political moment there. Well, Jesus comes and goes around 30 AD, and then things get really hot by the time you get into the 60s AD. You get worse emperors who come along, guys like Caligula and Nero, guys who were just absolute nightmares as leaders. And finally, the Jewish people get enough momentum to say, we're rebelling. And they do throw a rebellion, and it goes pretty well at first. The fighting range is all over, but Rome, you just can't trifle with Rome as the biggest, nastiest military in the history of ever. And Titus and Vespasian, father and son, take turns punishing the Jewish people They ultimately corner them in a bunch of cliffs uh, around the Sea of Galilee. That's where one of the famous last stands occurs. And the other very famous last stand of the Jewish people happens right down around Qumran, just a little further south on the Dead Sea in a place called Masada. Have you ever heard of Masada? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've heard of Masada. Do you remember what happened there when the Romans finally breached the walls? It's basically the Alamo, right? Except if if people with the Alamo killed themselves instead of (laughs) being killed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's an amazing fortress. I've I've been there. I've taken it in. The Romans built this huge siege ramp to come and destroy it. The point is it was a really good rebellion, and the Jewish people fought really hard and dug in really hard. But Rome always won at this point in history, and they punished the rebels very violently. They increased restrictions on the Jewish people. Well, another generation goes by after that with the poor people of Qumran sitting out here going— We're just trying to do religion out in the desert. Please leave us alone. But the more we fight, the more scrutiny comes down on us. We don't like this. So they're more and more wary. But then in the 130s, there's another revolt. And this one is called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And for a moment, there's an independent Jewish state that gets established. But ultimately, it gets crushed even more violently than the one that resulted in the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD. And after this, 
the Jewish state idea is just over. It's gone. It doesn't happen again until the 1940s. It is at this point that the writing stops at Qumran. It's at this point that the people who study this believe that the Qumranians, I don't even know what you call them, the Essenes at Qumran were like, we got to stash all of our stuff and get out of here. We got to clear out. And so apparently they take at least a thousand, maybe much more, who knows how many we haven't found yet, of these precious scrolls. I mean, their library, the written word was their most treasured possession. And they stash them in these super hard to see, hard to get to caves within about a five mile radius of their settlement and they flee. They take off. Now, surely the idea was when this stuff simmers down and Rome clears out and things get back to normal, maybe we can return and resume things. But as best as we can tell, they never came back. And the site is abandoned from that moment forward. And then these documents just hide in caves and go dormant for a couple thousand years. That's the stuff of treasure hunt, right? Yeah, it's amazing. You look a lot thinner than the last time I saw you, buddy. Yeah, I know. I mean, we haven't been able to scavenge like normal. No, we haven't. Ever since the nuclear winter, we're here in the back catalog, obviously, replacing an ad that's no longer relevant with with knowledge from the future. And, I mean, I don't know what to say, man. I haven't been able to scavenge like normal. I mean, sue me. What am I well, going to Well, you're 40% robot now, so you don't need as much food. That's at least positive. I am. I am. And the unfortunate thing is that my appendages that are now robotic are hydraulic. I got the old model. I didn't get the electromechanical ones like you have, which I'm frankly jealous of. Well, you were an early adopter. I waited for, I waited for you know, improvement in the technology. Yeah, I know. I, I thought it was cool and futuristic and stuff like that. But, dude, it's just not working like I want it to. And sometimes I'll be walking in a straight line, and then all of a sudden I get cavitation in my hydraulic line, like a little mm. air bubble, mm. I guess, and then I lose compression, and I fall over, and I look like a moron in front of all my other cyborgs, and I don't know what to do. You think you're going to get bumped down another level in the in the underground silo this year? I think so, but... I've worried about that. I'm trying to remain optimistic. You drop four more levels, and you're just going to become a crate mover, man. I understand. We need to scavenge more, because if we can upgrade your parts... Yes. Then maybe you can at least stay in the middle levels of the underground post-apocalyptic silo, and we can still hang out. But I fear that if we can't afford the oxygen rations to go out and keep scavenging, we won't be able to find you those parts, and we'll be separated forever as friends. I understand this, Matt. Where or where are we to find the resources to afford the oxygen credits to go and do the necessary scavenging to build back the rest of your non-organic cyborg parts well enough that you can remain useful to society here in the underground silo and we can continue to live on the same level and be friends. Well, I do have an idea. Okay. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, I don't know that this will work. So <laughs> crazy times. If we were able to get a message back in time to the earlier parts of the podcast, maybe we replace the ads or something back there. I don't know. I see. If we were able to do that, maybe we could tell people to support at patreon.com slash no dumb questions, which as you know, if we get enough supporters on patreon.com slash no dumb questions, we get to go beyond the mushroom level and we get to go up, mm. up into the, I don't even know. I mean, there's sunlight up there. We get to go beyond what? the fungus side, whatever. I don't even know what, what you call that place. I've never been since the nuclear winter. So I, if we could get enough support on Patreon... I think they'll let us go above, and our foraging would be more effective. What do you think? If we had enough oxygen credits, we could rove even further <laughs> and theoretically find what we need to preserve your aging cyborg body and our friendship. Yes. It sounds like this. What did you call it again? Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> I particularly want to try to find the parts that are failing in your memory sockets. Yes. I was like, what am, am I talking about my cyborg appendages or am I talking about... Yes, Patreon, of course. And then maybe we could afford a quart of Skydrawl, which, as you know, is the only working hydraulic fluid, which is also caustic, and it damages some of my seals. So, yeah, I, I would be down for it. If we could get the people of the past to support on patreon.com slash no questions, I think that's our only hope. It's a long shot, and if this is our best plan, things aren't looking very good, 
but it's the best we've got. And I say we just make the ask. I think we use. If you our would last... like to help our friendship yeah. survive the apocalypse, and help us have the ability to purchase oxygen credits sufficient to rove beyond our underground bunkers normal roving range <laughs> to try to find the parts we need to maintain Destin's ailing cyborg body yeah simply go to patreon.com slash no dumb questions and select your preferred support level thanks man I, I, that means a lot that you would be willing to use the last few drops of time travel internet on this thank you this is my greatest honor <laughs> Okay, got it. So I understand why the scrolls were preserved because of the environment they were preserved in. I understand where it's at, Qumran. I understand the people and why they did it. But what I don't understand is who found them and how. Like, it's 1940s, as you said earlier. So if it's the 1940s, we should know the exact name of the person that found these or like group of boys or whatever. Do we know that information? We do, and I'm not using any notes or anything here, but I did have to look this one up and just make a note of it. So the two guys who found it were Bedouin goat herders named Juma and Muhammad Edib, and I did not know that off the top of my head. That's a hard name to remember. These sound like Islamic names. Yeah, and that's one of the incredibly interesting ironies of the whole thing is two good Muslim boys discovered something that proved to be hugely helpful and important, not just to the history of the world, but very specifically to the history of Christianity and Judaism. Interesting. Okay. And how did they find them? So the story goes, and I've heard some people refute this, but there's no good reason to refute it. We only have their version of the story, so I'll just go with it. They were kids. They were herding goats up on these rugged cliff sides, and they're throwing rocks into caves, and they heard something break, and it freaked them out, and they ran away. And then later they got less freaked out and they came back and they went in there and literally they found these clay jars cracked open with dirt, dust, and visible large scrolls sticking out of them. And one of those scrolls turned out to be an almost completely intact copy of the book of Isaiah. So still the first discovery in all of this is probably the most significant. That scroll is kind of the big deal. It's interesting. Like, first of all, it's a weird story. I don't know. I've been a kid in the woods and I have found weird <laughs> things. I remember finding a six pack of beer out by the ballpark when I was young and I tried to be a good little boy and I was like, oh man, we found beer. We should pour it out. <laughs> and so That's I, a really nice gesture. Is I that what know. you did? That's what I did. And so I poured it out. But the did, problem is- Did I went you back pour it out my, into anyone's mouth or just like onto the ground? Onto the ground. Like for a dead person. But, but okay, the problem is I, I went back to my mom and I smelled like beer. <laughs> She's like, what's going on? <laughs> but I remember that what we did, and I remember going back and explaining it and it not making any sense. And I also remember going, seeing a bunch of icicles and telling my mom, hey, we saw a bunch of icicles and not telling her the part about us throwing rocks at the icicles that were like 10 feet tall and we broke them all. Didn't tell her that part. So this story kind of sounds interesting to me. It sounds like they went into a cave, they found some jars and then they threw rocks at it, broke it. And they're like, hmm, we probably shouldn't have done that. We'll leave that part out. <laughs> that's, that's, I think you're onto something. That's kind of what that sounds like to me. But regardless, they found a good thing. So these two boys found this. What do they do? They go tell somebody they found it? I don't exactly know how they made the connection, but somebody who heard from the boys sold them to antiquities dealers. And this was a huge deal for about 100 years from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th, where people could just go and buy like mummies. It was a common trade to just go buy somebody's dead body from a couple thousand years earlier and just have it in your estate in England no, or whatever. No way. Yeah. People bought and traded and swapped mummies. This was a thing. Okay, got it. So you can just buy things back in the day. Yeah. And so when people first found the scrolls, they were like, oh, it's not like we found this massive cultural important thing. They saw money. Yes. I mean, that was just part of the trade, part of the business at this time. And it's both a pity that that was part of the deal. And it's also kind of awesome because a lot of things got preserved that might otherwise not have because they were worth something and they were valuable to collect. You remember when Indiana Jones is having the fight and he's like, Belloc, that belongs in a museum. And, <laughs> you know, they're, they're all bickering about that stuff. Yeah. That really was pretty accurate. It was a reflection of the debate that was going on in the 1930s and 40s about how archaeology should be handled. And the British Museum is weighing in on that. Well, whatever the case, the initial cave gets lost. They can't remember which cave it was, or they couldn't figure out who the boys were who found it. Maybe the boys kind of went underground with this a little bit and didn't want people to know. Oh, for whatever reason, it took another year or so 
to just figure out who found the cave and to be shown where the cave was. And there's pretty quick confirmation that they found the right cave, which they call Cave 1, the first one to be discovered, because there's more stuff in there that hadn't been unearthed. Over the course of the next 10 years, all of these researchers show up and they're just pouring through every little nook and cranny in this very pockmarked cliff face, looking for anywhere else that these ancient, vanishing, almost cult members would have stashed their writings. As they poke around, they end up finding 10 more of these caves. You gotta just picture this for a minute because this is where you get into the really legitimate mystery and wonder of the whole thing. I just imagine being somebody in the 1940s whose job it is to go see if any of those caves have priceless artifacts maybe sitting in there. And, oh yeah, we've already found three or four caves that do. Maybe you'll be the one who finds the next one. And then you actually do dig down in there. You get deep in, you pull back dust, whatever it actually looked like to find it. And you see one of those little bits of parchment scroll sticking out of the ground. I mean, what must that have been like? Yeah. So if I understand correctly, this is what the way it's set up in my mind. There's this village where the Essenes used to live, but now, fast forward 2,000 years, this is where the Bedouin culture lives in this particular area. Some kids are out goat herding, mm -hmm. and however they get into this cave, they find these things, they take them back, they're worth money, and then people go back looking for more, and they find this whole other cave system, like a cave network. Am I understanding correctly? I don't think it's a network. Okay. I think these caves are caused by weathering from the outside in, not from pockets and internal forces. Like sometimes you get those, like Mammoth Cave isn't caused because a bunch of wind and rain hit the side of a cliff face and carved something out. It's caused by pockets of internal turmoil and the development of big chunks of rock. This is not a network, I don't believe. These are pockmarks, indentations in the cliff face. I don't mean to say this in a derogatory way towards the Bedouin. They obviously understood there was value there, but who is the first like expert in the topic showed up on the scene and was like, oh my goodness, this is what this is. When did it change from an interesting thing we found to the most important thing in the history of this whole field of study? There's a guy from Hebrew University whose first name I don't remember, but his last name is Sukunik. And he finds out that this stuff has been floating around and really wants to nail down where this was found, who had it, when they had it. And he seems to lead the impulse toward getting to the bottom of the thing. But the stuff is getting sold quicker than he can track it back down. And so, if I recall correctly, a few years after the fact, a handful of these scrolls went up for sale, like in a New York newspaper or something, an American newspaper at least. And that really gets people's attention. And at that point, you've got some religious folks in the area. I think uh, an Orthodox Christian monastery or leader comes into possession of a few of the early copies of this, and they're trying to protect that during a, an era of turmoil. You've got antiquities dealers who have them, and then you've got this guy from the Hebrew University trying to track it all back down and put the toothpaste back in the tube. By this point, we're into the mid-1950s, and now people are really starting to look, and this is when the big era of discovery of the additional caves, which end up being 10 additional caves, I think 11, are discovered in this initial run. That's when all of this unfolds. I've got the Wikipedia page pulled up here, and I'm, I'm going through, and I'm like trying to fact check you as I go. And it's a mess, man. You'll say a name and I'll I'll search for it and it'll be in some really weird place. Like so it's very clear that you're having to give me a very compressed version of events here. Like they're trying to track down where all these fragments were and all this kind of stuff. It looks like it got really weird. Well, it did get really weird. And you think about it, that is a function of geography and religion. I mean, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem is at the intersection of three continents and the three biggest historical world religions, everybody has an interest, and everybody's there, and you throw money into the equation, and you throw military turmoil into the equation, because this is when Israel is becoming a nation, and yeah, it's going to get a little bit weird. I'm just going to read random sentences from what I'm seeing here. Damp conditions from temporary storage of the scrolls in the Ottoman bank vault from 1956 to the spring of 1957 led to a more rapid rate of deterioration, and then you just scroll a little bit, and it's like, until the 1970s, the scrolls continued to deteriorate because of the poor storage arrangements, exposure to different adhesives, and being trapped in moist environments. And like, apparently these things changed hands so many times. At what mm -hmm. point were they studied? They're being studied from the beginning, but just not all at once. 
And even now, I don't think anybody owns all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, very recently, the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. tried to buy a handful of copies, and it ended up being a bunch of frauds that they spent a ton of money on, and they got duped. So there are recent forgeries even now of the Dead Sea Scrolls still floating around. The Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem has got a huge collection of these things, including a display of the great scroll of the prophet Isaiah. I've never seen that actual scroll, but I've seen a facsimile of it at the Vatican, and it's amazing how intact that thing is. There's a picture that I put in a YouTube video I did about this of President Obama standing there just marveling at the great scroll of the prophet Isaiah. So I guess your question is tough to answer because, well, which Dead Sea Scrolls? Which fragments? Uh, Lots of different people have had access to lots of different expressions of this thing, and the study of them isn't even really a uniform thing. Like, if you're looking at the great scroll of the prophet Isaiah, that's over 20 feet long, and it's almost entirely intact, and it reads just like the Isaiah that was in people's Bibles in the 1940s. Amazingly accurate. But the study you're going to do on that is not going to be so much trying to cobble back together the words. That part's already done. What you're going to be doing is trying to do a textual study to compare that to the other manuscripts of Isaiah that have survived the centuries to figure out how accurate these copies all are. Whereas if you go and get one of the gazillions of teeny tiny little slivers of Dead Sea Scroll that have been found, you're trying to cobble back together a jigsaw puzzle from history. You don't know if you're looking at a piece that dates to 200 BC or 100 AD. That's very painstaking. And so I think a lot of people from the outside looking in imagine that you just go with a shovel and you dig some crap out of the ground and then you're like, aha, here's one. Well, let me just thumb through this and we'll see what that is. And then you know, in fact, it can be the kind of thing that takes decades and decades. Once you've done a basic cataloging of these things, it can be a really long time before you have the money or the expertise needed to get that out, to handle it properly in a controlled environment and really put study into it. So I would say this. People have been studying it since very early in the game, late 1940s, early 1950s, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are way ahead of the research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. We don't know what we have yet. We have an idea of it, but we still don't really know what we have. Okay, so I'm looking at pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's like a really interesting looking jar, like a, a taller jar than it is wide. It's it's kind of hard to describe. It kind of looks like a, a, a tube like a, an earthen tube. And so I'm imagining this scroll just wound up in it. So is it kind of like books of the Bible where you just open a scroll and instead of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you just open up the tube that has numbers in it and you pull it out? So is it like that when you say the Hebrew Bible or, you know, the Tanakh or whatever it is? Is that how it works? You're just pulling out individual books? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. I mean, some of the books that in a modern Old Testament are separated out, like First and Second Chronicles, would not have been First and Second Chronicles in a Hebrew rendering. That would have been one scroll if it would fit, or it was considered one book, but it was just so big it had to go on two scrolls, depending on what kind of medium they were using. Twelve of the minor prophets are usually lumped together, like the really short little ones, like, you know, Obadiah, Amos, Joel, you know, those are really short books. But all the books of the Old Testament were there. No, not all of them. One is missing. You'll hear it said a lot that Nehemiah... Is it Ruth? ...was missing. Nope, not Ruth. Esther. The other girl one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Esther. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. And the reason Esther is missing is not surprising at all. Esther was always kept separately and still in, in a lot of places is because there's this holiday called Purim that celebrates the events of Esther where she and Mordecai thwarted the evil plans of Haman to annihilate all of the Jews And they did so by kind of working King Xerxes over, and God is not mentioned in the text, but he's a background character who's actually presented as being in charge of everything without his name even being mentioned. And so at the the festival of Purim every year, Jewish people read the entire book, a public reading of the thing. And this year there were live streams of it because it happened during coronavirus lockdowns. But this is a must-do thing. And so it would make sense to me that all of these people are going to take their copies of Esther with them. They're like, well, we can't stash that. I mean, what if we have to celebrate Purim before we can get back? We would need our copy of Esther and we need like, you know, one per household so that we can celebrate this thing right. So Esther is missing, but there's a historical explanation. But it's basically the contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls were essentially the Hebrew Bible. Absolutely. Yeah, it's 
the Hebrew Bible. Now, that's not all that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but a significant portion of the Dead Sea Scrolls are just Bible. I still don't want to spoil it. We'll talk about why this matters more here in a minute. But in addition to every book of the Old Testament other than Esther being represented, and you'll hear some people say that Nehemiah isn't represented, but I I believe we do have fragments from Nehemiah. Ultimately, I haven't looked at it myself, so it's possible. It's conflicting. Got it. Bible. Understand. But what else was in there? Well, there's a bunch of stuff that didn't quite make the cut in most religious traditions or in the Jewish tradition. Did you ever get an old copy of the Bible that has some stuff in the middle, like some bonus books that aren't familiar to you as a Protestant? No. Oh, you're talking about the Apocrypha? Yeah, okay, so you've heard of it. What do you know about the Apocrypha? I know the Catholic Church recognizes the validity of the Apocrypha and includes it, and Mm -hmm. most Protestant teachings do not. Yeah, that's correct. So the Jewish canon and the Protestant canon are the same. Protestants have the same books as the Jews— Catholics have an additional seven books. The Orthodox Church has a little different collection of books than the Catholics, but they also have what Protestants call an apocrypha, what they call the deuterocanonical books. Three of those books are represented in part or in full in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in addition to books that nobody thinks of as being Bible, but that are all really old and really interesting, like the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, which has crazy, super ancient legends about giants. And I mean, it's a wild read to cruise through the Book of Enoch. So we don't know whether the Essenes viewed those as Bible or not. It doesn't look like it because they didn't write commentaries on those books. And well, that gets me to another thing that was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were ancient commentaries. Have you ever picked up a commentary about a book of the Bible? Yeah, yeah. Specifically, Matthew Henry is the one that I've got copies of the Matthew Henry commentary. But yeah. What do you remember it doing? Like, like what's, what's the style of writing? What's the genre of writing? Basically, it goes through line by line, verse by verse, and it just... It's commentary. It talks about that and how this verse ties into this other verse from this other book, and it's just like an expounding of what it means or what it could mean even. Like sometimes it argues with itself. Yeah, and it's meant to interpret through the lenses of a point of view. And that is exactly what the Dead Sea Scrolls that are commentaries are about. So you got commentaries on Psalms and Isaiah and Genesis and a lot of them, not just one or two. And so for every one line of Bible, you get five lines of thoughts and reflections on it. And we have all of this stuff. Like You can read it. It's translated into English. You can see how the Essenes interpreted the Bible and therefore get a really clear sense of their theology, which for people like me is hyper interesting. Do we know any of the names of the Essenes that wrote it? Like, you know, I've heard of, you know, commentary hmm. from a certain individual. Do we see, like, this is... The commentary of some Essene name. I don't know what what that would sound like, but... Craig or Doug. Do we understand anything about the authors? You know, I don't know. I don't recall seeing any names attached to the front end of anything that I was reading here, but I haven't read every single word of these either, so I don't know. It would seem that stylistically, they did not tend to lead with the name of the author, but I can't guarantee that we never get the name of a commentator or an author. I don't know. That's a great question. Okay. So we've got all of the Bible scrolls. Then we've got the books that are more disputed or on the fringes of Bible. Then we've got these commentaries that give us even more Bible because all of the commentaries cite the Bible verses or passages that they're talking about. So when you add all of that up, there's a ton, a very large percentage of the Dead Sea Scrolls are Bible or para-Bible or commentaries on Bible. But if you were running a commune out in the desert, what else would be some really important stuff that you would write down and want everybody to read? Like like a local law, like a local rule book, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And so they have that, and they have it in vast detail. So we've learned a ton about this Qumran community because of the rules that they wrote about their ritual meals. And I, there's stuff in here about, like, if somebody gets naked inappropriately, they can't come to the ritual meal for a month. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's, it's insane, dude. But the absolute specificity of, of what these rules are. Um, you want me to see if I can find a couple of them? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Give me, That's fascinating. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, that's entertaining. Okay. 
Okay, here you go. This is from a scroll called The Community Rule. These are particularly uh, punishments, rules by which they shall judge the community. If one of them has lied deliberately in matters of property, he shall be excluded from the pure meal of the congregation for one year and shall do penance with respect to one quarter of his food. So if you lie, you get starved a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. Wow. Uh, okay. It says, whoever has spoken foolishly, three months punishment. Oh, God. Whoever has interrupted his companion whilst speaking, 10 days. How many days would that be? What was that? Oh, sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> what was that? That's right. 10 days, sorry, sucker. Sorry, 10 sorry, days. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get this one. Whoever has lain down to sleep during an assembly of the congregation, 30 days. And likewise, whoever has left without reason an assembly of the congregation has as many as three times during one assembly. So if you leave more than three times and get up, you have to do penance for 10 days. Okay, here's the nudity stuff. Ready? These people seem like, uh, I don't know what the word is. What word can I say in modern times for this type of uh, rule following bookkeeping? Um, yeah, I don't know. Tread lightly. Good these luck. Pe- these people seem uptight. How about that? I think fundamentalist is the clinical, proper, historical term for this. Okay. I mean, fundamentalist is something you say to call people out when they're more rigid than you. They're like fun and it can suckers. can be used as just a cheap insult. But yeah, it's people who take it really seriously and think that the rules have a lot to do with it. But also, I'm kind of sympathetic to this. I mean, these guys have abandoned everything. It's an entirely voluntary community. And the existence of the community depends on everybody playing by a certain set of rules. I'm not signing up for these rules. I think it sounds awful. But you have to be pretty rigid to make something like this work or it's going to go mosquito coast on you really quickly. Can I read you the stuff about nudity and spitting? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the purpose of the podcast, right? <laughs> the, the passages is about gone nudity in the Dead before... Sea Scrolls. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, all led up to this. Whoever has gone naked before his companion without having been obliged to do so, he shall do penance for six months. Whoever has spat in an assembly of the congregation shall do penance for 30 days. Whoever has been so poorly dressed that when drawing his hand from beneath his garment, his nakedness has been seen, he shall do penance for 30 days. <laughs> so are these all dudes? They're all dudes, yeah. Really? So, so what does the companion mean? That's a fantastic question, and I don't know. I would assume that it means anyone else who shares the community. Whoever has gone about slandering his companion. So, yeah, community member. So we're not talking about it like a, a settlement where families and husbands and wives exist. We're talking about like it's like a club. These Essenes were a club of people. And so there was an, an existing established community where people would farm and create food and stuff like that. But if you were to go out to this Essene place, this is an altogether separate thing. I think so. So they're not farming out there. They're not creating their own food. Am I to understand you correctly? They're bringing stuff from civilization to them. And so this is like a monastery where, you know, modern day monks brew beer and stuff like that. I mean, is this like a something similar to that? I'm not sure I understand. Yes, I picture a monastery and the area isn't that big. I mean, it's pretty much excavated. So we know it wasn't a huge community, but I don't know where they would have gone. I guess they could have gone a little bit north toward Jericho. They're not far from Jericho. That's a big town could have done business, interacted with people, bought supplies there. But they had to make something in order to sustain their existence. So surely they were managing animals of some type. I don't know the answer to your question. It's a very reasonable one, but I don't know the answer. Okay, got it. So let me summarize where we're at. In my mental map here, uh, I know why we found them, because they weren't disturbed because of several different environmental reasons to include social stuff. I know where we're at. I know who found them. I understand how they changed hands a bunch of times from the moment they were, you know, found to, you know, studied and all that kind of stuff. I understand who the Essenes kind of were. Not really, but kind of. Um, I understand that they really didn't like seeing each other naked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a thing. But all the books of the Old Testament were there with the exception of Esther. And you've also got these rules, community rules. What else? Like, is there more to the story here? Yes. They were into horoscopes. Horoscopes? Yep. What do you mean? They looked at the stars and the seasons, and they assigned some kind of prophetic meaning to it. I don't totally understand how all of that works. Astrology? Yeah. Some kind of astrology. 
which is right on the edge of a no-no for the Jewish people. But here is a, a passage from one of the astrological horoscopes, and it's, it's all broken up, so I'll do my best to make sense of it. It looks like it's a description of maybe a celestial being or maybe a constellation. It says, and his thighs are long and lean and his toes are thin and long. He is of the second column. His spirit consists of six parts in the house of light and three in the pit of darkness. And that is his birthday of which he is born in the foot of the bull. He will be meek and his animal is the bull. If you know what to do with that, you are a better man than I. But it falls under this astrological segment in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So... It sounds like these numbers that you're describing, slowly read it again, please. When you talk about the numbers of light and dark and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Sure. His spirit consists of six parts in the house of light and three in the pit of darkness. And this is his birthday in which he was born. Birthday in which he was born. Yeah. And all of these have language about house of light, house of darkness, bowls, and a description of this person's figure. What's the birthday? It doesn't say like a day. I don't know. I mean, if it's a horoscope, it would be assumed that the day on which it is read is the, this is his birthday they are referring to. What that makes me think of, I have no idea. I'm just spitballing here. I'm just a guy that likes space. So what it sounds like to me is it's describing a constellation that has six stars that are closer to the backbone of the Milky Way and three stars that are Hmm. further away from the backbone of the Milky Way. And if there's a specific Hmm. date on which he's born, you know, the nutation of the earth and certain times of the year, you can see certain things. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So as as the North Star, Polaris, as it goes up in the sky and down in the sky, what is the latitude that we're at here at the Dead Sea? Uh, It's pretty low. It's not equator by any means, but inside a tropic. Okay, 31 degrees. I wonder if there was a date associated with that, if that particular constellation became visible at a certain time of year. You know what I mean? Well, it seems like you could go and dig that up and do the math on it, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems like you could. I mean, it's kind of like you doing the math on what it would have felt like coming into Mobile Bay on the morning of the battle with a drone. Sun would be here, you'd be feeling this, you know, X time of year. Yeah, likewise, we could know what they could see and not see but still pretty tough to figure out what they spiritually or prophetically are trying to intone by it. Yeah, I'm looking at a a website, a list of constellations visible seasonally. And so he's talking about the House of Light. If you've ever been way out in the desert, I remember being in Cooper PD, Australia, and being able to see every single star. Obviously, I couldn't, but it felt like I could see every single star because there's just no light pollution or anything like that. And you can see the backbone of the Milky Way with your naked eye, and you're like, what Mm -hmm. is that? It's amazing. And so there's a part of the sky that's brighter. And so what this sounds like to me is the description from someone that's saying, hey, there's six stars that are in the bright area of the sky, and there's three stars that are in the dark area of the sky. And this specific constellation, you can see it at this time of the year. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, but it's fascinating. And what you're bringing up that I find interesting, what you're doing is using your science brain to humanize these people. They wrote stuff down. We don't know exactly what it means, but they were looking at the same star as we were. They were assigning meaning to things. They were seeing patterns and rhythms, and we might not at all agree with the meanings they assigned to those patterns and rhythms, but they thought like us in that regard. They were observing. They were observing, but they didn't have polar coordinates to speak of that we do. Like, you know, if you look up at the sky, if you were to say, how far above the horizon is that? You know, they didn't have a sextant and they could just say, okay, well, it's this many degrees off of Polaris. You know, they they didn't have that type of language. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, but they were doing crazy advanced calculations on questions of calendar. And that's another one of the prominent types of literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls is calendrical literature. What do you mean? Where they're trying to make sense. Do you remember what kind of calendar the Jewish people used? No, not at all. Okay, they used a lunar calendar. Makes sense. And the result is that you got a lot of wiggle room in a lunar calendar from year to year, right? I mean, you're going to have oscillation in what happens when, and over a long enough time, unless you do some really goofy leaps and adjustments, you get a calendrical drift. Right. And that's something that we tried to get straightened out with the calendar reforms of the Middle Ages, the Gregorian reforms, et cetera. Well, these guys were pushing back on the idea of a simple lunar calendar and trying to find a way to make it more steady. And we know that because we have all of this description of where certain dates and festivals should sit to make them consistent and steady. 
which would make sense. You know, if there are people group that lasted for times and a half what the United States of America has existed for, they would have been interested in things like continuity. And what well, can I read you a little bit of their calendar document? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. On the fifth day in the week of Jachim, which is the seventh day of the fifth month, and the new moon is on the first day in this week. I can't read that word because it's broken up which is on the 24th day in the fifth month. On the Sabbath, in the week of Hazir, which is on the seventh day in the sixth month, and the new moon is on the second day in the week of Pet... Uh, I, can, I can do this. Petahiah, which is on the 23rd day in the sixth month. And dude, this goes on for page after page. Like, there's no point in me reading all of this to you because... Each one of these paragraphs, I read you about one-fifth of one calendrical calculation here. Every one of these sets of calculations is done entirely verbally, just like that. This goes here, that goes here, the fifth day there, the 23rd day there. And somehow they were triangulating this into a more consistent calendar or trying to. And it looks like this calendar had to be calculated on a multi-year rotation at least four four years in rotation to make it all add up. So you're right, they didn't have maybe the same tools that we do now or that people even a couple hundred years ago did, but they were doing some pretty advanced stuff to try to make sense of the natural world around them. That's awesome. It's a lot of stuff. It, it sounds like they're just taking data. It's like they're trying to document it as best they know how for people in the future. Yeah, and I, I don't know. Like These people were religious fundamentalists in a way that I don't really track with, but they were humans. I mean, they got up every morning and looked outside at what was going on around them, and they wanted to make sense of it and put the whole thing into order. So yeah, gathering data, trying to get their world in a place where it was somewhat controllable and predictable. I mean, that's a pretty basic human impulse, regardless of what people think about God, religion, personal behavior, or whatnot. And we get a little glimpse of that when we look at these scrolls, which I think is hyper interesting. Can I tell you about the best scroll? Tell me about the treasure, though. When you were researching for this video, you said something about a legit treasure map. Yeah. And I'm thinking Peter Pan pirate map kind of thing. There is a legit treasure map. So all of the scrolls are written on pretty much either parchment or papyrus. Parchment is stretched skin. Papyrus is a forerunner of paper. But there's one that is etched in copper, and it's called the copper scroll. Not surprising. The Copper Scroll is the best thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I want to find a way to fund a trip to the Holy Land to go and see if we can find the things that are described in the Copper Scroll, <laughs> because it's just a treasure quest. That's all the scroll is, dude. 64 treasure quests listed out on a Copper Scroll. I'm not kidding. Can I read you some of these? Hold on. Stop. So you're saying we've got to preserve all these things for the future, like, our civilization mm -hmm. is dying for whatever reason. Look, you know what I think it's time for, Matt? I'm completely ready. What is it time for? It's time for me to reveal something that I've had this whole time right here in this drawer. Let me get it. Right here. This is a tape that I have. <gasps> I bought it at a market in From an antiquities so dealer. South America, of all places. And oh my. this is a cassette tape that was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. You wouldn't think that possible. I have it right here. And it says right here, it's a it's an 8-track, so it's really old. It says right here on the 8-track, it says, the moment we put the Dead Sea Scrolls in cave number 7. I don't know what that is, but would you like to hear it? It's so exciting and obviously true, because why would you lie? I know. Do you want to hear it? I'm dying to. <laughs> okay, let me put it in here. Let's put it in here. Barnacles, what are you doing? Hark, fair testicles. I'm putting these important Bible documents in this cave. I assume you're doing this because the Bar Kokhba's revolt has gone awry, and the Romans are running roughshod over everything, and they're about to come here next, and we're assuming that we're going to be run out of this village here, Qumran. Is that the deal? I mean, in, in I don't... all of my time here at this Essene compound, I have never in all my life felt this just down... Things just don't feel like it's going great. Is it? Are you feeling the same thing? This is an incredibly depressing time in our history. And it feels like the only thing we can do is cut bait and hope to return later. I don't know. You were sitting there telling me you were doing something. What are you doing? I'm, What's with the jars? I'm wrapping dude, where up. where did you get the jars, man? That's, dude, that's all of our jelly jars. Where have you? Carl made all of them. 
He made extras so that we could still take jelly with us. Larry has those, and he's already left. And I got the extra ones from Carl, and I'm just putting these these Bible scripts in there. Dude, real quick. First of all, I'll get back to what you put in the jars, but, like, look at your robe there. What? Dude, you know our supreme leader, the teacher of righteousness, does not like nakedness to be shown. Look, right there. Look right I'm there. I'm not naked. Look what's hanging out right there. You're looking in the gap. Look at it's it. It's because of how you're putting your head. You're going to get Nobody 30 days. Nobody can see that from a normal angle. You're going to get 30 days. I was just in here putting Bible scrolls. I'm not taking 30 days. I'll give you 10. I'm doing this for you. You know what the community rulebook says. You know this. I'm your friend, Barnacles. I'm telling you, cover up your nakedness. Okay? Are we done with this? And, Are we done with this? And I'm telling you that nobody would have seen my nakedness if you weren't nosing around in this Bible urn cave that I'm working in. It's down <laughs> It's down there by your knee. Look, that right that's what I'm talking about. How can it Yeah, roll it up. Okay, cool. All right, so here's the deal. Now that we've got that addressed, what are you putting in the clay pots or jelly jars? What are you putting in here? I'm putting in all of the precious documents that we want to preserve for posterity's sake. And I thought the best place to put these would be in Cave 7. What's in there? Well, okay, here... you got the rule book. Rule book's important. I've got copies of our rules in case people forget some of those. Yeah, like the nakedness one. Got it. And I've got these commentaries on the book of Genesis in okay. case people want to know what we thought about that later. Yeah. And... I've got all of my favorite horoscopes that didn't warn me that my supposed friend was going to come in and make fun of my slightly visible butt crack while I was putting these Bible things in urns in a cave privately. <laughs> what about the uh, the treasure map? Did you throw that in there? You mean the copper one? Yeah, the copper one. Did you put it in there? Yeah, I, I got it right here with me. I don't want to hide it with all this other stuff. I mean, if somebody finds the copper one, that's like one password. If somebody gets that, they get all our stuff. We got to be smarter with this one. Okay, so let me look at it. Here, hand it here. Let me see it. Just, be, just, please, I, it's my... Dude, just let me see I'm in charge of the copper... Let me okay, see, fine. Okay, I've got it. Okay, now look. Here, let's look. Oh, dude. How are we going to identify where all the treasure is? I forgot when they wrote this. Okay, look, let's see. Da, 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 the trees. Okay, cool. Got the trees. The river. Okay, got it. Dude, this is everything. Yeah. If somebody finds this... Dude, why are we, why are we leaving this? This is like... Look, two gold bars under the tree. Why would we leave this here? Why don't we just take this with us? The gold is super heavy, and we have to get out of here. And also, if only some of us come back later. You know what the truth is? Testicles, none of this makes any sense at all. But I just really wanted to do it. I read about it in a weekly reader, and it seemed like it'd be a super fun thing to try to imitate. So I, I, I made a little treasure hunt, and I hid all of the things from our treasury. Is and it... now it's too late, and there's no way to undo it, so we just have to find somewhere to hide the copper scroll. Well, the, the thing that I'm really proud of you here is that you identified the locations of all the treasures based on, like, trees and things that will most certainly never go anywhere, especially over a long period of time. I know, right? Yeah, that tree's going to always be there, so everybody's going to know where the gold is if they find the copper scroll. All about it. Yeah. Yeah. Or perfect. the well. You can't take down a well. You can't. It's genius. It's making me nervous with you having the scroll. Can I? Can I please just? Could I? Can I please have the scroll back? Yeah. Here you go. Here, re read a couple more real quick. I only read the top few. What does the last few say there? Yeah, I'll read them to you, but only if you promise not to tell anybody because I want this stuff later. <laughs> go ahead, read it. Okay. And in the canal which ends in it, there are ten talents. You know the canal, right? No, I don't actually. Well, hopefully somebody who's more imaginative than you finds this someday. Here's one that I'm going to keep in the cave of the old washer's house on the third platform. 65 gold bars. Like legit? You know, the washer's house? No, I don't. I mean, surely the washer's going to live there for hundreds of years. Nobody will ever know that place so. is anything other than the washer's house. <laughs> right, and it's on the third platform. So just <laughs> even if they build additional platforms later, just remember which the first one was and then count up from there to three, and that's where you're going to find all that gold on the third platform. What else did they Does say? Does that make sense? Yeah, what else did they say? Well, I can tell you this. According to this scroll here, somebody later is going to find 40 talents of silver in the hole of the waterproofed refuge in going down towards the left three cubits above the bottom. 40 talents of silver, man. They spread this out, man. They spread this out. Did they tell you where to write all this? Is that how this went down? Yeah, everybody got to hide one and write their own clue. I think as it went along, people were maybe just trying to make it trickier than the one before. I mean, some people wrote down some little Greek symbols here, but I don't know how those clues help with anything. 
I'm just hoping that we can just remember and, and get them all back later. There are 64 of these in total. Hold on, wait, dude. I just, uh, okay, Talent of Silver. That's about 33 kilograms. Okay, we have to get out of the skit because I just Googled some stuff. Get out of the skit. Okay, <laughs> let's just go get out of the skit. Dude, it says a talent is 33 kilograms. That's, all. That's a crap ton of money. <laughs> yeah, it says, what? We're talking about like a million and a half dollars worth of silver. And that's just one of the 64. There's 64 different treasure things on this copper scroll? Yes. There's one hidden in a tomb that just says the tomb of the third, 100 gold bars. Surely this is happening. So surely everybody has looked at this copper scroll and like Indiana Jones stuff is happening right now. That's the only explanation. Yeah, but apparently nobody's found any of it. But here's the thing. Would you go tell people if you did? Like if you spent all the money to go and find it and you found 100 gold bars, are you going to go and be like, I found it? What's more interesting is what would it it look like? Like a gold bar from way back in the day, just the physical... Like, the way it's molded would be interesting, you know? Yeah. I mean, now there's kind of a standard gold ingot size, I think. But I don't know when that came into effect. Uh, Yeah, I have no idea what it would look like. Okay, so I'm looking at pictures of the copper scroll, and it looks like it's written in something that looks like cuneiform, but it's not. Is it all written in Hebrew, Aramaic, or what is this written in? Odds are it's Hebrew, and yeah, here it is in front of me. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls are Hebrew, and this is indeed Hebrew. Though I'm ashamed to admit it was hard for me to tell just looking at the thing with my naked eyes. Ah, it's fine. That's cool, man. This was a pretty good adventure. So so we know where it's at. Mm -hmm. We know why it survived. We know who found it. Mm -hmm. We knew the Essenes Mm -hmm. had it there. We know that they left when the Bar Kokhba revolt took place. The Jews were revolting against the Romans, and... The Romans got serious about everything. The Essenes kind of left town, and they left all their stuff in these caves. And we know that at the end of this podcast, you and I are going to the Dead Sea to look for treasure. (laughs) And we'll totally tell everybody if we find it. (laughs) That's interesting. Totally. Yeah, so let me ask you a question as we get toward the land the plane moment here. Picking up what you've picked up here, why do you think this matters? So it's like this. It's like, hey, we had this thought of how everything was for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we found this external source that validates that the way that we were doing things this whole time didn't actually change. Like our ground truth, it provides an external third party almost source to tell you that your texts were indeed accurate this whole time. So I guess that's my question. Did they agree? Like did the Dead Sea Scrolls and the writings on the Dead Sea Scrolls, did that agree with the ancient Hebrew Bible? It sure does. Like one for one, there were no errors. No, there are errors. Uh, There there are discrepancies, but it is sub 5% and almost nothing that fundamentally changes meaning. I mean, you think about the way language evolves over the course of 400 plus years, or in this case, more like 1,300 years, to be in the same not just the same zip code, but the same content in terms of meaning with differences only appearing on very slight details of spelling, grammar. Uh, that's just shocking. So so to understand how amazing this is. But you're saying 5%. Dude, there's a lot you can do in 5%. Yeah, there absolutely is. Like, for example, you could say, we should go eat, comma, grandma, or we should go eat grandma. <laughs> right. That's like 1%. <laughs> so, I mean, like 5% right. covers a lot. And if what you're looking for is potential ambiguities from a single source, 5% not clear is quite a bit. But that really isn't the exercise here. And we don't need the great scroll of the prophet Isaiah to have a sense of what Isaiah is. What we're rather looking at is to see whether it corroborates what we have for much later. So to understand how big a deal this is, you got to do a little timeline here. With the New Testament, we have fragments of the Gospels dating back to somewhere in the second century, so potentially even within living memory of the original writing of those Gospels. The New Testament has got the better part of 30,000 fragments or complete manuscripts 
It is the most well-attested ancient document by a landslide. It's not even close. Does that mean that it's all true and everybody should be a Christian? Uh, it doesn't mean that necessarily. That's for everybody to think about for themselves. But that we have in front of us what was written down in the first place is a pretty reliable bet based on the enormous amount of New Testament manuscripts we have from way back in the day. Old Testament is a different deal, man. The Old Testament that we draw on to make our Bibles until very recently is drawn from a thing called the Masoretic Text. That's the Jewish scholarly text that is the result of the process of a few centuries of work in the first millennium. The oldest copy of the Old Testament of Isaiah that we had prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is from roughly 1000 AD. Oh, Dang. Then we discover the great scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and we jump back 1,100 years. What it, was going on 1,100 years before now in Europe? Off the top of your head. Uh, plagues? I don't know. I guess that was later there than There might that. have been one. I don't know. That was later. Like, yep. I don't know. We were figuring out how to smelt silver. <laughs> the, the, the point is, you're crazy smart and well-read, and nobody knows what was going on off the top of their head 1,100 years ago. I mean, I went to school for this, and I could give you a few things, but even then, I don't know what was going on 1,100 years ago. It's just not something you talk about or think about. I mean, we can't even read any language from 1,100 years ago unless we carefully study to be able to do so. That is forever. And the idea that the document we've been basing the Old Testament off of, this Jewish Masoretic text, would look almost exactly like the Dead Sea Scrolls from 1,100 plus years earlier is a historical anomaly. It is mind-boggling how much that shouldn't be the case. Again, to my skeptical third chair friends, does that mean that everything that I think about God and religion is right? Well, no, I mean, there's, a, there's a ton of questions you got to ask that go beyond, is the text reliable? But it was a huge confirmation that what we are reading now from the Old Testament is a very, very, very accurate representation of what they had even centuries before the time of Jesus, and that's a huge deal. Yeah, I'd say. That's a very big deal. That's why it's kind of one of the holy grails of my discipline. When you find a trove like this, it just answers so many questions. And not just is the Old Testament a reliable representation of what was written down in the first place, but it also answers a bunch of questions about the time of Jesus. There's this whole political landscape that Josephus, the Jewish historian from the first century, he kind of speaks to it a little bit about some of the main characters in the New Testament, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, but it's not a super well-documented societal moment in history outside of the New Testament. And the Dead Sea Scrolls really provide some clarity and confirmation that a lot of the historical details and social details of the New Testament are, again, an accurate representation of what was going on at the time. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, because if the New Testament writers had just made up a whole world of fictitious characters and places and politics and social things within living memory of the events it described, everybody would have been like, that didn't happen. It would be like if you know somebody tried to write a book right now, and it's like, yeah, and then Mongolia and Ethiopia attacked Pearl Harbor. We'd all be like, no, they didn't. We know who it, it, it was Japan. Like, what are you talking about? You can't just change stuff that close within living memory. So it's no surprise that this stuff would have to check out or, you know, the New Testament wouldn't have survived history because it would have been immediately debunked and written off. Again, what people do with Jesus and the religious question is a different part of the equation, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are very vindicating for the reliability of the Old Testament text and very vindicating for the historical, social, political realities described in the New Testament. You don't have to believe it, but just to write the Bible off as being nonsense, that the Dead Sea Scrolls would push back on you over that. That was kind of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know how sometimes you get into the thing that you're really into and you're like, boom, here we go. Yeah. No, the, yeah so, no, me too. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for teaching me about this stuff, man. This is stuff I don't think about, admittedly. I feel like I should have thought about it, but I haven't. So thanks for taking the time to yeah. do the research and, uh, frankly, unload all the information on my face. That was great. You're a good sport. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoyed and it. Sometimes it's just tough to be like, hey, this really matters, and, and here's why, quickly. You got to give the whole story so that other people can see the beauty and appreciate the gravity 
of what is a really neat thing, no matter where you're coming from in terms of your perspective on life and history. So how do you want to end the episode? I want to put a big red bow on top of the whole thing by saying this. One, you're an awesome friend, and thank you for being willing to engage with stuff like this with me. It, it really does mean a lot. It's fun to get to geek out about it and be excited. So one, thank you very much. Two, this is really exciting for me because it's just a dang good story. It's something that has all of the elements that Peter Falk talks about at the beginning of The Princess Bride, except maybe pirates, and even then it kind of has pirates. It's just adventure and mystery and romance and spanning the ages and buried treasure. I mean, this stuff just, it ticks all the boxes for stuff that's really, really interesting. And then third, it overlaps with things that I really care about, that I studied a lot, that matter to me on a personal level. And it's fun for me, at least, to process how this integrates on the academic side of stuff that I care about and also on the personal spiritual side in some ways that we didn't really get into here but that I think are pretty compelling too. That's how I want to put a bow on it. 